Well, I hope you guys had a good weekend, and I'm glad to be back. We're going to talk today about journal bearings some more, and we're going to talk about them hopefully um, in a little bit more pointed fashion so that we end up with the ability to solve certain types of problems with respect to these journal bearings. Um, toward that end, you might remember one of the things that we left off with when we talked about journal bearings last time was that the big shortcoming of Petroff's equation is that it assumed that the center line of the journal remained in the, uh, you know, at the center of the bushing. And so one of the things that uh, happens there is that with journal bearings, if the center line of the journal remains um, at the center of the bushing, the bearing actually doesn't end up with any capacity to carry load. Or another way of saying that is, if it is carrying load, it will push the center line of the journal to where it is not in the center of the bearing. Okay? But there's this interesting reaction that occurs, and it's, it's a, you know, a predictable reaction uh, if you understand fluid dynamics a little bit, um, that as the center of the bearing pushes away from uh, the center of the bushing, right, the, the center of the journal pushes away from the center of the bushing, um, that actually creates a little uh, you know, effect that we want to look at, and that's why I have this picture up here from figure 12.9, which in edition 10 is page 619. So what you see there is that this journal winds up being a little bit off-center, and probably the best pictorial or mental, mental picture that you can have of what goes on once that journal gets a little bit off-center is what happens whenever your car hydroplanes. Okay. You've got your wheel of your car rolling, and if there's a lot of water on the road, then the water that's on the road actually winds up sort of jamming itself in between the wheel of your car and the road, and it creates this cushion of water between the, the wheel of your car and the road. That's actually the reason why uh, most tires actually have the grooves in them, or it's one of the reasons they have grooves in them, and is, is to try to basically break up that effect and, and cause there to be less of that water cushion between the tire and the road, okay? Well, with respect to journal bearings, um, we actually want that effect, right? We want that fluid to create a cushion between the journal and the bushing. And what happens, you might notice here, the rotation direction of this journal uh, is clockwise. And you can imagine all of this kind of pink area right in here. This is where we're assuming there's a lubricant. And by the uh, journal spinning around, it actually draws the lubricant that's up in the upper part into the lower part, and as it draws that in there, it begins to pressurize that uh, lubricant. And because the pressure ends up different down on the bottom side relative to the top side, that's what creates the uh, c capacity to carry load, right? But that doesn't actually occur. You know, you don't actually end up with any increase in pressure unless there is some of this off-center effect. It is the idea that you're sort of jamming this fluid into a smaller and smaller space. That's what creates the pressure, and so that's what creates the support. Okay, so I, I just kind of wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, there are several very interesting pages in this textbook where they kind of go through and uh, help you see where the source of Reynolds' equation, I have Reynolds' equation written up here, kind of gets you to see some of the sources of that Reynolds' equation. Um, but it's a very interesting thing that it says there in the book that we don't actually have any analytical techniques to solve uh, Reynolds' equation, at least not exactly. And so what is done is Reynolds' equation, which describes the fluid flow in a bushing like this, um, it is solved numerically through a number of different techniques, um, you know, or graphically, and we end up with solutions that work. They are approximated solutions that work for this expression, but there aren't any closed form exact solutions for an expression like this. And so what we do is since we want to be able to design bearings, uh, either design or analyze bearings that are made in this way, we want to be able to utilize solutions to this equation that aren't things that we can just easily solve for ourselves. And the way that we do that is through a series of charts and these charts begin on about page 628 uh, with figure 1216 in your book. There are a number of charts that allow you to relate several of the variables that matter to us with respect to bearing design. And these charts arise out of 
these uh, kind of approximated solutions to Reynolds equation. That's why I wanted to put this up here is to give you an idea that there is actually a, an analytical technique of coming up with these relationships, uh, but then when it comes time to solve them, um, then it's not so easy. Uh, Reynolds equation that I'm showing up here is one that actually includes the capacity of the fluid to flow sideways, okay, relative to the picture that I show up here. That would be along this Z direction, kind of in and out of the page. Um, there's another version of it where you assume that there is no side flow um, as well. But in any case, we aren't really going to use this equation. I just mainly wanted to put it up here to let you know this is the source of all the charts that we're about to use. All right, and they are, they are uh, approximated solutions to this differential equation that created those, uh, those charts. So let's get into our problem we're actually going to solve today. Okay. For the problem we're going to solve today, we are going to assume that we have a journal that has a diameter of 2.25 inches. We want this journal to be able to carry a load of 600 pounds while spinning at 2,800 RPM. Okay. Um, the length in and out of the page, right, uh, from what you see there, the length in and out of the page is going to be uh, 1 and 1 eighth inch. Uh, within this bearing, we are going to use a lubricant that is given by the specification of SAE40. That's a way for us to have some idea as to what the viscosity is going to be of that, um, of that lubricant. Let's also say that that lubricant is going to be at 150 degrees Fahrenheit at the locations that matter to us. Okay? One of the big things that I will ignore, at least for this analysis, is how do you come up with uh, expectations for what these temperatures might be. Okay? And I think I mentioned last time, uh, with many of your uh, devices that use bearings like this, they actually have to have some sort of a part or, or system in place that can carry heat away from these bearings because as the bearings roll or, or run, they do end up creating heat and that creates a temperature rise within the bearing. So I'm going to kind of ignore that and instead of deal with that, I'm just going to say here's the temperature that we expect the lubricant to get up to uh, in, this, in this bearing. All right, and here's what we need to do. Um, we have a couple of, uh, we have, let me actually say, we have a design component that I want to do first with this problem, and then we have a series of different analytical components. So the design component is I want us to figure out a radial clearance that we think will be appropriate for this bearing. And I'm going to do that by basically trying to, um, you know, end up optimizing that radial clearance in between a couple of, of different uh, optimal points that are identified in figure uh, 1216. So in figure 1216, it gives you one curve uh, that says that that's the uh, kind of the parameters that are optimized for the maximum amount of load carrying. And then it gives you another curve that gives you the uh, parameters that you should have on this chart for minimum uh, friction factor. Okay. And what I'm going to suggest by the first three items that I put up here, let's figure out a radial clearance that basically places us midway between these two optimal points. So it basically says, um, you know, we do have good load carrying capacity, but we also have reduced friction uh, by some amount. So that's kind of what we're doing with those first three steps. And by doing those first three steps, we get to specify what the diameter should be of the uh, bushing side of this. So we've, we've set what the um, journal needs to be, and now we're trying to set the size of the bushing. Okay. After we do that, once we get that parameter of D, then we're going to step down through some of these other steps and figure out things like the minimum amount of film thickness. Okay. That kind of refers to in a bearing like this, there is some location where the film is the thinnest, right? And if that film gets too thin right there, we remember seeing this last time, what happens if that film gets too thin? Okay, you end up having a certain amount of contact between the journal and the bushing, and that basically sets up what they called unstable, an unstable situation, unstable lubrication, and we saw that with that little chart. And the reason for that is that if that, uh, 
lubricant got any thinner, it would cause more contact, which would cause more heat rise, which would cause more contact, and at some point you would end up um, burning something up. Okay, so that's we want to. That's why that number matters to us. That minimum film film thickness. Um, very much related to the minimum film thickness is something that's called the eccentricity ratio. Okay, so we're going to find that too while we're there. Um, maximum film pressure. Okay, that's another thing that matters. Um, your lubricant has to be able to carry certain amounts of pressure. So we're going to look at that. Um, and then for number seven, that's a very interesting question, is how much power are we losing in this bearing? Okay, there's a couple of reasons why that matters. One is you typically want to reduce the amount of power loss as much as possible. Like imagine this being a, a crankshaft of an engine. You don't want to use your energy of burning your fuel to heat up your lubricant, right? That's not a good use of that energy. So as much as possible, you want to reduce the amount of power loss uh, because by reducing the amount of power loss, it leads to less heating up of the lubricant uh, and it leads to more of that energy actually going to the road, which is what you want. All right, then number eight, the uh, lubricant flow rate. That refers to how fast the lubricant is flowing uh, sort of around and around and around in the bearing. Okay, so that, that can be a little bit confusing because a lot of people, when they see the lubricant flow rate, they uh, kind of equate that to, oh, well, that's how much fluid or how much uh, lubricant I might need to deliver to the bearing. But that's not really what that's about. That's talking about the fluid flow rate inside of the bearing. So imagine for a moment uh, you're ignoring the fact that there is going to be some leakage out of the sides of the bearing, and you're just looking at how fast is that lubricant flowing around and around and around in the bearing as it is being um, turned. And that's a, a volumetric flow rate that we're going to be finding. And then lastly, the lubricant side flow rate. That's one that actually matters more to us because that is the rate at which we need to think that we are going to replenish the lubricant in the bearing, right? So, and how, how fast we need to do that is a function of how fast the lubricant is, is rotating around and around in the bearing, okay? So, kind of give us a picture of what we're looking for and why we're looking for it. Sounds good. So let's actually start. There's something we need to start with before we even really start answering any of these other questions, and that is, you might see that we have an SAE40 lubricant. The only reason that matters to us really is that we need to know viscosity, right? So before we look at any of these questions, we need to take a look at this SAE40 uh, lubricant and determine a viscosity. So let me actually start with that and I'll pull up our first chart that we're going to look at. This chart doesn't come from the uh, Reynolds equation, right? This one actually comes from just, uh, you know, probably experimental relationships for various kinds of oils. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to say if we are operating at 150 degrees Fahrenheit, we will read up along this curve until we hit the kind of oil which I believe that's the curve that we're looking for right there, okay? And then we will read over from where that uh, intersection happens. And that gives us what they call absolute viscosity over here, which is given in units of micro ren, okay? So that tells us that that number right there looks, looks to me like it's 4.5 micro ren. Okay, well now what does that mean? Okay, I'm going to kind of put that over here, 4.5 micro ren. Okay, here's what I want to show you. You might remember there was a dimensionless group that we used, right? That dimensionless group had uh, viscosity, which was mu times what? N over pressure. Okay. And what I want to show you here is that Ren is actually, if we want to kind of use it with respect to uh, these units, a Ren is basically a, um, you know, this is going to be a little hard to do, but it's basically a PSI 
per revolution per second, which is what makes this uh, a, you know, a unit that cancels out the other units in that dimensionless group. Okay, so that is a Wren. All right, well now what do we do with this? Okay, remember what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out the C that causes the lowest amount of friction, and then we want to find a C that gives the highest load capacity. All right, so we go to uh, figure 1216. And I have that over here. Okay. And next to figure 1216, I wanted to kind of show you uh, what, what 1216 is kind of driving at for this. Okay. Um, over on the vertical axis, we're looking at minimum film thickness variable, which is the minimum film thickness divided by the radial clearance. So it's this ratio, more or less, that tells you how far off are you from your original um, you know, radial clearance. And that is shown right here. That's where your minimum film thickness is going to be. It is going to be located angularly off from straight along the direction that the load is being applied. Okay. And, uh, and as that happens, this curve right here gives you what the distribution of pressure is going to be right there. The direction of those arrows kind of shows you the distribution of pressure on the bushing side. Um, but that is what creates the ability to react against the load that's put on the journal. It's the fact that we have this asymmetric uh, pressure distribution that happens along one side of the journal. Okay. Now, where we use this chart is you might see here we have a situation where this dotted line right here has been determined to be where you would want to design a bearing if what you're trying to get is the maximum load carrying capacity. Okay. Over here is where you would want to design a bearing if what you're trying to do is minimize your friction factor. Okay. And what we're basically saying here is that we want to try to kind of split the difference between those two design points. Okay. So let's go ahead and identify where those two design points are. Um, notice these curves are given with L over D, okay? And the top design curve is L over D equal infinity. That's basically a really long journal bearing, okay? What that does is it kind of gives you a limiting case, right, for all of these curves. Um, what is our L over D ratio? Okay. L is point, you know, 1.125 inches, and D is 2.250 inches, okay? So L over D is going to be equal to 1.125 over 2.250, which is just one half, okay? Now, what would you do if you wound up with a ratio like this that didn't lie exactly on one of these curves? Okay, you can eyeball it. That's what one person says. Um, I would say, no, no, you shouldn't eyeball it. Actually, it probably is good advice not to eyeball it um, if, um, you know, if you're trying to get a real exact answer. But if what you're trying to do is at least get some, something close, then maybe eyeballing it is okay, all right? Um, you can interpolate between these curves, all right? So that's, that's what I'll say is that, you know, it's a, not a bad idea to try to interpolate the, between the curves if, um, you know, if what you need is just, uh, is, a, is a more accurate term and you don't end up with a ratio that's given with one of these curves. All right, so we're basically looking at a point right here and another point down here. Okay, and what we need to do, um, I'll say, is that we need to figure out, um, you know, what kind of what we're trying to find there, right, is the clearance, right, because that will let us size what the bushing needs to be. How big does the bushing need to be if we know the radial clearance that we need? 
All right, and you might notice down here the bearing characteristic number is the value that's along the horizontal axis. Which of these values do we know? All right, bearing characteristic number says S is equal to R over C squared times viscosity times the speed over the amount of pressure in the bearing. Okay. Which of those things do we know? Okay, we actually, yeah, we know all of them because we actually also know how much load this bearing needs to carry, right? You might remember that from up here. We're holding 600 pounds of load is what we need to design this thing for. All right, so. <clears throat> um, we, we can actually figure out all of these variables except one, and one of them is C, right, which is the radial clearance. So my suggestion is that what we need to do is look at these two design points, okay? So I have this one right here, and it looks like it intersects right at about this location. Okay, and then I have another one over here that intersects uh, right at about this location. Okay, and this gives us two different Sommerfeld numbers. Then we're going to try to find a C value that puts us uh, basically halfway between those two locations. I'll say that, I didn't need to say that a little bit differently. We need to find the C value that puts us at each of these locations and then choose a C value that's halfway in between those because that's not exactly the same outcome as what I said the first time. All right, so what I'm going to say now is that finding where exactly these, you know, these lines, what these lines imply is not easy on these charts because these charts are not printed very well. Okay, and my, my hope is that if you ever end up doing actual like journal bearing design, for something other than a homework problem. Um, my hope is that you'd end up with better charts than the ones that we have in this text. But we'll go ahead and run with these for now, and I'll show you how to see this. Um, what we have is, down here, this is a log scale, right? Down here, we have log scale. And up here, we have a linear scale. That's the first thing to notice. On this log scale, it's a little bit hard to read because it's not always the same amount of divisions um, between each point. And so what I'm going to say here is that it looks to me like they were trying to set this up such that that point right there was point 0.03 and that each of these little divisions before we got to that point was supposed to be point 0.002. All right which means that at this location that we actually found right here, it looks to me like that should be 0.028. All right, so let me, let me say that that's our, our S for minimum friction, 0.028. Okay, now what about up here? This one's possibly even a little bit harder to read than the first one. Uh, a lot of times I kind of start big and zoom in since these lines seem like they aren't super nicely drawn, that, like right where I think there would be a line. I don't always see a line. So I'm going to say where we, end, where we should end up with a value of 0.3 should be cheated a little bit to the right relative to the exact middle between these two lines because it's a log scale. Does that make sense why that would be? And so I'm going to look at that and say it looks to me like maybe this point right here was what they were trying to say was point three. Okay, but that's not what we have. It looks to me like from there to the end of the scale, uh, we have one, two, three, four. We have five divisions, so those are going to probably be uh, each of them is point zero two right, which tells me that I think that this right here should be um, 0.34, okay. 
And I'll tell you, when I first did, the first time I did this out of this textbook, um, you know, it took me a while to come to these conclusions, right? Because these are not, again, these are not very nicely drawn uh, divisions on this chart. We're going to go ahead and use them, but, uh, and hopefully it will at least give us the, uh, the practice of using them, okay? So now let's take those two values. Um, this 0 .034 is basically the Sommerfeld number for the maximum load. Okay, let's take those two numbers and figure out some radial clearances based on those two numbers. Okay. So, uh, 0 .028. Okay, is going to be equal to R over C. What's R? Okay, 1.125. Okay, that's not because it's L, right? That's because it's half of uh, the diameter of the journal divided by the C that I'm trying to find there, that squared, times my viscosity which is 4.5 times 10 to the minus sixth. That's because it's a micro wren, right? Okay. This is going to be now multiplied by 2,800. Okay, this will be in revolutions per minute, because you might remember that was the speed that I said that this bearing was turning. Now, Ren is actually relative to seconds, revolutions per second rather than revolutions per minute. So what we need to do is multiply this by uh, 60 seconds in the denominator for a minute in the numerator. And that will cause the Ren to cancel and uh, end up with, well, at least the uh, kind of the speed and time units of Ren will cancel. The rest of Ren is PSI, and so we need PSI in the denominator. You might remember that where we get that capital P for this dimensionless group is based on the, uh, the area uh, that is projected between the journal and the bushing that it sits in. Okay, So that's just going to be equal to the diameter of the journal times the length of the bearing is the area, the projected area that we have there for um, the basis of P, okay? So we have 600 pounds is the load divided by, okay, the diameter, 2.25 inches times 1.125 inches, okay? So that is just diameter times length. Okay, and all of the stuff on the right is a Sommerfeld number. The target Sommerfeld number is 0 .028, and this is for the case where we are trying to minimize uh, friction. Okay. And if you solve this for C, uh, the C value that ends up coming out of there is 1.816. times 10 to the minus third inches. Okay. Now what if we want to maximize load carrying capacity? Okay, for maximum load capacity, instead of 0.28, we basically do all of this same work and we change 0.28 out for what? 0.34. Okay. And when we do that, we should be able to solve for our radial clearance. 
and that radial clearance value, I think I may have reversed these before, excuse me. Um, the result up here, I, I reversed which ones I cited for which ones. So the result up here should have been 6.328 uh, times 10 to the minus third inch, and down here, this one should be 1.816 times 10 to the minus third. Okay, and this kind of makes sense. You would expect that um, maybe a tighter bearing would allow you to get higher fluid pressures within the bearing, and that might end up allowing you to maximize your load carrying capacity. The looser bearing uh, is likely to allow freer fluid flow, which might end up making a lower uh, coefficient of friction. So those tend to make sense to me that that's how they would uh, wind up. Okay, so these are the uh, limits for my radial clearance. What do I do with those? Okay, take the average of them. All right, so if I take, um, you know, maybe I'll call it the, the design value is going to be equal to the average of 6.328 and 1.816. Okay, <clears throat> and that ends up giving me 4.072 times 10 to the third, minus third inch, okay? So right at about four thousandths of an inch. Yeah. Yes. Okay, because what you're doing there, um, and I may have, may, I'm, now I'm looking at it to see if I cited them incorrectly. Um, no, I, I've got them correctly. So what they have to do is cancel the units that are in the rest of the expression. Okay, so the question was, why is it that you have PSI over revolutions per second, right? And uh, the reason why is that you have PSI in the denominator of this whole expression well, that basically has to get absorbed with the units of Ren, right? And then you have uh, revolutions per second in the numerator up here. Well, that has to be absorbed in the denominator of the unit of Ren itself, right? So, yeah. Uh, this is not Newton. Um, that is speed, okay? N is the, whenever we're talking about... Um, a, uh, a speed that is not in radians per second with respect to these uh, questions, we're going to use a capital N for that variable. So we would have different kinds of units that would be used. The question is, how would you do this if we were in SI units? We don't use REN in SI units. Uh, the, uh, the type of units that we use in SI is uh, millipascal seconds. Okay, um, and one of the reasons for that is that revolutions technically is not a unit, right? And so that you might see that that ends up being the same dimensionally uh, as what we're doing for Ren, okay? Basically pressure per angular speed, since seconds are in the denominator of that, you can put them back up in the numerator. And so millipascals, millipascal seconds ends up being an equivalent unit uh, dimensionally, you know, as far as dimensional analysis to the one that we're um, looking at. Good questions. Okay, so this ends up giving me my uh, radial clearance that I'm trying to design for. What do I use that for? Okay, the bushing diameter should be equal to the journal diameter. The journal diameter was 2.25 inches plus what? Two times this clearance. Okay. 
And so now, if you're going to have these made or something, you know exactly what size to, to ask someone to make them. Okay, so 2.2581 inches. Okay. <clears throat> cool. That's, we're done with the first part, uh, or the first few parts, I guess I should say, of the problem that we are trying to solve. Okay, so we just found the D that is midway in the range implied by 1 and 2. Now, using that D, let's figure out what the minimum film thickness uh, is that we, uh, that we will have given that D value. Okay? So we actually need to go back into this chart again, but this time we're going to use the Sommerfeld number in more of a forward direction rather than a reverse direction. Okay. Uh, the Sommerfeld number that we will have, okay, and I'll call this a design Sommerfeld number, is going to be based on, again, the radius of the journal divided by the actual radial clearance now, C, remember, that's what we just said, is 4.072 times 10 to the minus third inch squared times everything else stays the same in the rest of the expression, right? 4.5 times 10 to the minus sixth ran uh, times 2,800 RPM <clears throat> slide this down a little bit um, times uh, up here we have 60 seconds in a minute and then all this over 600 pounds over 2.25 inches times 1.125 inches. All right. And that Sommerfeld number, we end up with 0 0.0676, which is kind of, uh, that's kind of a lot of digits <laughs> relative to how we're going to use it. Uh, because what we need to do now is take this number, all right, this is the Sommerfeld number we're shooting for, take that number into the chart uh, that we looked at just a minute ago, okay, and use it as the horizontal, as the location along the horizontal direction, okay, 0 0.0676, okay, so here's 0 0.06, there's 0 0.08, right? About halfway in between them is 0 0.07, right? And I'm not sure we're going to be able to get it super tight, but it'll be a little bit to the left of that uh, 0 0.07, which is right here, okay? And we're going to read from there up to... this line. Okay, and when I read up to that line, it actually puts me to where I'm real close to this line right here. Okay, and so that gives me a value over here of 0.1, and each of these is 0 0.02, right? So 0.1 plus, that's 0 0.12, 0 0.14, 0 0.16. All right, so out of this chart, I basically say that my minimum film thickness, uh, H naught, right, variable, it's, the reason it's the minimum film thickness variable is that you normalize it against what your um, original radial clearance was, and so it gives you this dimensionless number. So uh, 0.16, 
we're saying here is equal to H naught over that radial clearance that I talked about a second ago, which was 4.072 times 10 to the minus third inch. Okay. And that means that my minimum film thickness, H0, ends up being 6.515 times 10 to the minus fourth. Oops. Inch. <coughs> Okay, and just to remind us again, what we're talking about is where that film gets the thinnest, where the journal has moved off center a little bit. Okay, now let me show you this other one that's, you know, it's easy to get while we're here, um, and that is the, called the eccentricity ratio. Um, as a matter of fact, there's even an equation in here that gives you the relationship between minimum th film thickness variable and eccentricity ratio. It is this, it says uh, minimum film thickness over uh, radial clearance is equal to one minus the eccentricity ratio. Okay, and so what this basically tells us here is if we take one minus 0.16, that gives me my eccentricity ratio, so. Okay. The other place that you can see that value, um, you know, you may have already noticed it, but when you go to uh, the chart over here, I need my slow old computer to keep up with me here. All right. You can read it all the way over here, and you can see there that the eccentricity ratio is shown on the other side of the same chart, right? Because it's just basically one minus your film thickness variable. Okay, so that's a couple more items that we were hoping to find. Any questions at this point? It's basically a number that shows you um, how far off you are, are from center relative to what you could be. So if you have zero, that means that you're right in the middle, right? You're not eccentric at all. But if you end up with a value of one, it means you end up to where you've used up any eccentricity, now you have contact. So you basically have right in the middle, and then here you have parts contacting. Does that make sense? So it just gives you a number that goes from right in the middle to parts contacting, and it's just this number uh, as a ratio. Say what now? 0.84. All right, any other questions? All right, so now we've done, let's kind of check through here. We found minimum film thickness, eccentricity ratio. What about maximum film pressure? Okay. If we come down in here, we see another chart, figure 1221, if you're in edition 10, page 633. Now that we've established our bearing characteristic number, the rest of these charts end up pretty easy for us to use, 
Okay. We start with knowing that bearing characteristic number of 0 0.0676, I believe is what we had. Um, that puts us over here, right? 0 0.06. Now this one might be even harder for us to see where exactly we should be. Um, and so um, it looks like between here we have 6, maybe we go to 0 0.07, 0 0.08, 0 0.09 and point one, and each of those is bisected by another line, <laughs> right? These are, they don't all work the same way. So that's what it looks like to me is that that number right there is 0 0.07. That would be 0 0.08. That would be 0 0.09. Those don't all matter to us. What matters to us is over here that we are a little bit to the left of this, of this uh, 0 0.07 because that's our bear, bearing characteristic number that we are trying to achieve. So we go up here and we come to where we hit that one half ratio. And so then we can read from there over to this axis. And so there we've got 0.2. We have one, two, three, four, five divisions there. So that tells me I've got 0 0.22, 0 0.24, 0.26. Okay. And, uh, and what is it that we get out of that? Okay, that is giving us this ratio of our pressure that we got from our projected area relative to what the actual maximum pressure is. So that ratio of the pressure we had for the projected area over the actual max is given with this uh, value of 0.26. Okay, well here's how we use that. 0.26 is going to be equal to 600 pounds over 2.25 inches times 1.125 inches. Okay, remember that was our capital P. This divided by what we're trying to find, P max. You solve for P max. Okay, this ends up giving me 911.7 PSI. Right. That was figure uh, 1221. Okay, 1221 is what gives us the maximum film pressure ratio relative to bearing characteristic number. All right, so the next thing we're supposed to find after that maximum film pressure, which by the way, um, I know this got in the way of that a little bit. Let me slide it to the left just a bit. Okay, if you're thinking graphically, that tells you what is that peak amount of pressure that you have in that pressure distribution. Okay, that's what we just found. All right, so now we go up here and look at our next thing we're supposed to find. Maximum, oh no, power loss. Okay, because we just finished that one. The power loss, how do we find power loss? Okay, this takes us to a little bit of thinking to figure out how much power loss we're going to have in this bearing. Okay, we need a friction factor. Remember, a friction factor is equal to what? Tangential force over what? Normal force. Well, it just so happens we know what the normal force is in our bearing. The normal force is 600 pounds. Well, if we can figure out 
the tangential force, okay, or if we can figure out F, I should say, if we can figure out F, then that tells us how much tangential force we've got. How does that help us? Okay. Right, so if you go all the way back up here, we're running with 2800 RPM. There's a tangential force that's distributed all around the perimeter here that is resisting the direction that it wants to turn. Well, that can be turned into a torque, right? That tangential force times the radius of the, of the uh, journal gives you a torque. Well, now we have a torque and a speed, and what does that give us? Power. Okay, but the starting point is we got to find our friction factor F. All right, so we go over here, and I believe my next chart that I have set up here allows us to do that. I actually referenced this one in our last lecture. This is the one that's most closely related to Petroff's equation. All right, it is not Petroff's equation, but it, is, it gives you the same kind of information that Petroff's information was trying to give in a less sophisticated way. Actually, as a matter of fact, if you could have a load-free uh, journal bearing, that is Petroff's equation, more or less. So, um, all right, so we have, what is our bearing characteristic number? Okay, 0 0.0676, I believe this one might divide similarly to our last one where it goes six, seven, eight, nine, and one. So that is, this value right here is 0 0.07. So we go a little bit to the left of that and read up until we hit a little bit further. That point right there, okay, because it's our one half ratio. And so then if I read from there over here, Okay, 2, 2.2, 2 2.4, 2.6. And 2.6 is equal to this dimensionless group of R over C times F. Okay. So, well, 2.6, 2.6 is equal to R, okay, remember R is just the radius of the journal, and 4.072 times 10 to the minus third inches was our uh, radial clearance, and this is multiplied by F. And when you solve this for F, it ends up giving you 9. 0.411 times 10 to the minus third. Okay. Well, so now we have that. We, get, we say this is equal to 9.411. Okay, and this gives me a tangential force. 9.411 times 10 to the minus third, I should say. So my tangential force then is equal to, um, based on that expression, 5.647 pounds. And how do I turn that into a power loss? Okay, first a torque, right? Um, so that would be basically, I mean, I'll write the equation up here. Power is equal to torque times angular velocity. Okay. That torque is just going to be equal to 5.647 pounds times the radius of the journal. Okay. That gives me an amount of torque times the speed. 2,800 revolutions per minute. Now, I'm going to do a few more unit conversions here because one of the things that I might care about is to turn out what this power is in something like horsepower. 
right? So what do I do with that? Okay, here I've got inch pounds. Um, we have two pi radians per revolution. We also have 60 uh, seconds in a minute. And then many of you won't, probably won't remember this one, but the conversion from uh, inch pounds per second to horsepower uh, is with the factor of 6,600. Okay, so 6,600 inch pounds per second is a horsepower. Okay. And so what this ends up giving us, once we plug all that stuff in, is a power loss of 0.282 horsepower. All right, and that power's gotta go somewhere, right? So it goes into heating the lubricant. And so that's why when you're, when you drive in your car, your oil gets hot, right? And this is one of the reasons why your oil gets hot is that that, um, that energy has to go somewhere and it goes into heating the oil. And a lot of your cars will actually have a cooler that will then try to keep the oil within reasonable temperature ranges. All right, the next thing we were supposed to find is a lubricant flow rate, okay? And I talked about that earlier. Remember the lubricant flow rate uh, isn't the flow into the bearing that you need, right? It instead is kind of this rate of flow, volumetric rate of flow that goes around and around and around within the bearing. We call that Q. It's a volumetric flow rate inside of the bearing. And what you would actually notice with that volumetric flow rate is that the velocities get a lot higher at the location where the, uh, the area is small and so you more or less have a constant volumetric flow rate as you go around and around because the velocities are high but the area is small down low and then the uh, velocity is a lot lower but the area is high up in, in the upper part. Okay, so I didn't really talk about that before but um, Q basically ends up being about the same all the way around the perimeter. Okay, well how do we get Q? What's your guess? Answer, there's a chart for that. Okay. Here we have a flow variable. Okay, the flow variable is volumetric flow rate divided by RCNL. Okay, that's the uh, radius of the journal, the radial clearance, the speed, and the length of the bearing. Down here we still have the bearing characteristic number. And so, just like we've done in the past, uh, we need to take this and figure out where 0 0.0676 is. So that's like right here. So we read up until we hit uh, the curve that we're looking for, which is like right up here. Okay, right about there. And I read across, and it looks like that gives me, so this is 5 and 6, and we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 divisions in between, so this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5.5. 5. Okay, so 5.5 5 is equal to Q over RCNL. Q over the radius that we have is 1.125 inches. The radial clearance that we had was 4.072 times 10 to the minus third uh, inches. Okay, the N that we had was 2800 
uh, revolutions per minute, but we don't want it in revolutions per minute. We want it in what? I mean, you can leave it in revolutions per minute, but it'll give you a flow rate as a per minute value instead of a per second value. So it kind of depends on what you want uh, with respect to that. Uh, I believe what I did here uh, in my notes is that I did convert that into a per second. <coughs> Just like this. All right, and then L is the last term. And remember, L is how far in and out of the page this bearing went. And we said that that was 1.125 inches. So just to be clear, that's radius and that's length. Okay, so when we plug all of this stuff in, we end up getting a Q value uh, that is 1.323. This ends up being in cubic inches per second. That's kind of a lot, isn't it? It kind of seems like it to me, all right? <clears throat> that may be why we're increasing so much heat and why we're you know, losing so much energy is that we're moving fluid that fast within the bearing as it spins. All right, well that, you know, that's an interesting number and all, but what might matter to us more is what is the side flow rate, okay? Why does that one matter? Because that probably gives you an indicator of at least how fast you're going to have to deliver oil, you know, lubricant into this bearing. Because if you're leaking out that much, you better be replacing it, right? So this is an interesting one that we should know about. So how do you find that? Okay. There's a chart for that too. Okay, so down here I have the flow ratio chart. And this one's actually pretty simple to use because all it tells you is how much flow will you have out the side relative to how much flow you have uh, going around and around. So again, we find our bearing characteristic number. It looks like I actually already had it drawn on here. That takes us right up to this point and it ends up giving you a 0.9 Okay, and so what we do here is, you know, we say the slide side flow rate QS over the flow rate we just found, 1.323 cubic inches per second is equal to 0.9. And that tells me that Q sub S is going to be equal to 1.19 cubic inches per second. Okay. All right. And that kind of covers the items that I had laid out for us to try to find up here in our uh, problem statement. We do have like two minutes left. Um, does anyone have any questions they'd like me to try to touch on? Yeah. Okay, the last two that I did, uh, the question was, can I show those charts again? Okay, so the first one is what they call the flow variable. Okay. And then the next one is called the flow ratio. And that just kind of tells you how much you have leaking out the side per, or the rate at which it leaks out the side relative to the rate it, it's flowing around and around. Yeah. Is 
Okay, the question is, is there a place we can get charts like this that are easier to read than the ones that are in the textbook? Um, let me give you the kind of the two halves of that answer. The answer is absolutely yes. They do make better charts than the ones that are here in the textbook. Having said that, um, the problems that I write are based on the ones that are in the textbook. Okay, and it, if you end up with a chart that's different, um, you know, you might end up not getting the answers that you would really want. Uh, the other half of that answer is that where it really matters to most people is on exams. And I will say that uh, the way I try to get around this on exams is that sometimes um, just by picking values in a certain way, you can make it to where curves land on really nicely uh, divided you know, lines. That's what I try to do on exams so that I'm not testing you as to how good your eyesight is. I'm testing you instead of were you in generally the right region on the test, or excuse me, on the, on the chart, and then you'll be able to get the number that I got too. Does that help? So uh, I'm, again, I'm not trying to test you on your eyesight. I'm trying to test you on, you know, do you generally know how to use these charts? All right, anything else? Wonderful. Well, I'll see you on Wednesday.